to be with you this morning. It's good to be with all of you in one service this morning. It has been, I believe, eight months since we've all been together in one service. And maybe some of you are thinking, well, didn't we just celebrate the Lord's Supper? I say that since we're together all in one service, it's been eight months, and we're going over a passage about the Lord's Supper. Go figure, let's celebrate the Lord's Supper. So what is in a picture the next slide I have here, kids, I love you, you didn't know this, but this is, this is a picture of one of our Christmas cards that we had put out, you know. So each year, for some time, we had made up a Christmas card. You get together as a family. Maybe back in the day in the 80s, it was Olin Mills. They kind of would procure everyone's wallet for a long time, and they would take a picture, and you would get that, and you'd send it out to people. Well, on this Day, this picture shows our family. This, I believe, was about 10 years ago, maybe 2010. You can certainly correct me, honey. Feel free to. I'm only up here in front of everyone. But um, around 2010, and this, man, we, like, we're all smiles. Like, there's big smiles. Everyone's good. You got a Christmas tree in the background. Looks pretty, pretty good, if I must say so myself. Everyone's together. At this point in the framework, Joshua has not put his foot in Ella's face. Um, I, I think we all look pretty happy. But the reality of this picture, if you kind of zoom out, what you can't see is that this is the last of countless attempts to put something in the mail to our friends and our family that suggested we cared even anything about Christ and each other during the Christmas. We were at our wit's end, if I remember correctly, way behind on getting this in the mail, and my haircut being so short is due to the fact that Jackie accidentally put the wrong attachment on the clippers while graciously cutting my hair for budgetary reasons at that point in our lives. And one of our smiling, adorable children only survived this day because of God's grace. I'll leave that up to you to surmise. But we often take a picture, you can certainly change this slide, I beg, of a moment in time. We, we freeze it. We like to Photoshop all of the details that surround it in order to keep things neat and tidy. Everyone's looking good, everyone's feeling good, and both the scene and the scenario seem to present themselves in perfect order. We just had the senior recognition night, and I saw all kinds of pictures from seniors that were up here. I believe that there were roughly seven of them that were recognized, and you had many pictures. Even the youth leaders, no, I did not steal any of those pictures. They will not be in here, but I so wanted to. But even the youth leaders had some of their pictures in there of when they were seniors. For some of them, it was more than a couple of years ago. But it was great to see all the pictures, and I would assume that all of the moms and all of the dads who put all those pictures together, made sure that they picked the very, very best. This is my little guy, and this is my little girl growing up, and they put them in the best scenarios, and then the best outfits. And maybe some of them were, I mean, humorous. I mean, very hilarious. But dare I say, if I were to pause and to ask them, now, as you picked out those pictures, were there any that you maybe passed up for any particular reason? Maybe they didn't capture the moment as clearly as you would have liked. Maybe there was rage in the picture. Maybe someone was thrown in the toilet. Maybe it was of a toilet. I don't know. But the reality is if I asked you to, to kind of frame out that picture and to tell me what the scenario was, either the children were doing something maybe inappropriate or maybe the parent behind the camera was saying something maybe that was unnecessary. Maybe the scenario wasn't easily uh, uh, understood from the way in which it was painted in that picture. But we'll do that in our lives. We'll say, here's a picture, and we Photoshop, and we forget the outcome, or we forget what happened prior to that picture being taken, and we try to freeze it. Well, this same thing can often happen when we come to the Lord's table. At the Lord's table, something very significant is pictured. Maybe we think warmly and fondly of the fact that Jesus is up in heaven. Maybe he died for us. Maybe we think that he's saving a place for us, up, for us up there somewhere. We break a cracker, we drink some juice. Maybe we reflect on a bad word said and that we'll try harder to be better Christians until next time that we celebrate the Lord's table 
I don't know exactly what runs through your mind when we are asked to examine our hearts during that time prior to partaking in the elements, but whatever it is, I want us to see what Mark pictures in the following verses. I want to to look at the details of the passage, but then I want to take a step back so as not to miss the forest for the trees. So we'll get into some nitty-gritty, not all. This would be more of a teaching segment for, honestly, a, a long time, Passover and all that it captures, what it means, what it translates to, what Jesus fulfilled. I'll look at some of those details, but then at the very end for application, I'm going to take a step back so that we see it in its broader context, that we don't zoom in too closely, that we don't become too individualistic in understanding when we grab that cup and that wafer and what it means. I want us to see the big picture because I believe that each gospel does paint one and Mark does here in this chapter. Now we already know from last week that at the start of Mark 14, the Jews are celebrating the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover. As Pastor Aaron noted last week, the city of Jerusalem, it would be bustling. It would be just absolutely packed. I believe the details were something from maybe it was 50,000 on a normal day or weekend to during Passover time, five times that amount, at least 250,000 people, maybe even more. And knowing that Passover represents the fact that this is the high point of a Jewish person's life in regard to sacrifices and coming rent with your heart saying, God, poured out for me the lamb. You can imagine the amount of sacrificing that was going on, literally, the the animals that were being sacrificed. Some accounts have up to 250,000 lambs being sacrificed. And being that they had a particular time in which they needed to do that, I I don't want to picture what that is sometimes, but it's real. But a lot was going on. So coming into this passage, Mark has just let us know that the chief priests and the scribes were looking to arrest Jesus in stealth while Judas willingly took them up on the offer to play his appointed role as the betrayer. And so as we come to verse 12, Jesus takes center stage and he clearly orchestrates the events to come. So two disciples come up to Jesus wondering where they can prepare Passover meal for Jesus to eat. And Jesus then sends the two disciples on what reads like a covert mission. I don't know about you, but I I know I hear oftentimes, and honestly, I thought it when I was younger, that the Bible can be boring to read or that the Bible has points in it where I'm just like, please get on with it or what have you. But when I read stuff like this, I'm like totally into some like mission impossible thing. You're reading it as some like covert mission that somehow they're going to be meeting somebody in some city. You can picture it with an accent like, how you doing? Some guy on a bench is going to meet you somewhere. He's got a newspaper called the Jerusalem Times. Not the Tribune, but the Times. You know, you see this displayed, and so you're looking at it. In Mark 13, and and excuse me, in verse 13, it reads this. And he sent two of his disciples, and he said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says, Where is my guest room, where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? In verse 15, and he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. Now, a a man carrying a jar of water. Okay, maybe within the context of that story and the tens of thousands of people that would have been there. Okay, maybe that was unique. In that time, a man would not have been carrying the jar of water. That would have been a a woman. She would have been carrying the jar of water. So maybe that's maybe the unique scenario that's being painted here. But regardless, with all of those tens of thousands of people roaming about, clearly this is something that's either prearranged by Jesus, meaning he met up with somebody beforehand where we don't see it and count it in the scriptures, and he prearranged for this meeting to take place, and all of the rooms and all of what's fashioned up there was already set out, Or as omniscience as God comes into play, knowing all of the necessary people and places to make this a reality. I can't speak to that. Scripture doesn't necessarily. But what he does, he asks for a large upper room. A large upper room. This wasn't just an upper room that could just fit the 12. He wants something that is large. Now, I know that in a lot of accounts, and if I go, if I remember, if I remember correctly, into the 200 level, and you walk down the hallway, I believe there's a picture of when this church at some point did the Passover supper, right? Um, And there were a whole bunch of people, I want to say, 
JP was in there, George, there were some people with beards that never had beards in their lives, and you would never see them with beards. Well, you see that picture right there, and it's usually just 12 people at a, maybe a raised table that we are used to. But maybe this is saying that there's something more than just the 12 disciples that were there. A handful of commentaries would suggest that there are more than just the 12 disciples. It actually broadened, and that's why they needed the large upper room. It also might make sense of, when you come down to uh, verse 20, he says, Jesus says, it's one of the 12. Well, why would he be with 12 people and say, well, it's one of the 12, as if he's speaking outside of just that context. He would say, it's, it's one of you. So maybe there were more people in this large room, but with the 12 that were primarily around him. I don't know. But in verses 17 through 21, Mark picks up with the disciples and Jesus now mid-meal. So now he enters with the 12 disciples. They've probably been eating for a couple of hours at this point. The Passover meal needed to start at night and then it needed to be completed by midnight. So as we're entering this in Mark's accounting of it, we're already into the meal. We're into it by a couple hours, most likely. And they're reclining at table while eating, which would have been common to recline at a formal meal such as Passover. And though we can't be sure of the exact elements of the meal by this point in the life of the Jews, as you will find many renditions when researching, I, I looked up, hey, what's that a Passover meal? And you can look at commentaries, you can look at all kinds of blog posts, you can look at Jews who recount it, you can look at Christians or Messianic Jews who would recount it, and they all have a whole bunch of different things, but there are some common elements that we would have um, that would have been there. There were various items eaten in between cups. It incorporated four different cups to be drank. And in between those cups, it would remind them of God's faithfulness as he delivered his people from slavery at the hands of the Egyptians. And the four cups are thought to be rooted in the fourfold promise of God to Moses in Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. It should be on the screens. I have this scripture. It says this, Say therefore to the people of Israel, this is God speaking to Moses, he says this, I am the Lord, and I will bring you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians, and I will deliver you from slavery to them, and I will redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great acts of judgments. And verse 7, I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God who has brought you out from under the burdens of the Egyptians. And that's some would suggest that the four cups that they drank intermittently in the Passover meal that they represented those promises that were there. So that's, I will bring you out, I will free you from slavery, I will redeem you, and I will take you to be my people, and I will be your God. Now the common elements that would have been eaten there were unleavened bread, which would be eaten, picturing the Israelites needing to get out of Egypt quickly. That's why it was unleavened. They didn't have time for it to rise. They had to get out of Dodge. It was time to go. So they didn't wait for that to happen. They would have had bitter herbs, which would be brought in to picture their bitterness and to remember how bitter they were during their times as slaves in Egypt. They had stewed fruit um, that was brought out. This was mixed and kind of mashed together. Maybe sometimes they would have nuts with it. And what would this picture? It would picture all the bricks that they constantly had to make day after day after day under the Egyptians' thumb so that they could build stuff for whatever the Egyptians wanted as slaves. And then, of course, the meal of a roasted lamb would be brought out to remind them of the blood of the lamb, which was spread on the doorposts in order for the angel of death to pass over their house marking them as God's people. And then lastly, kind of before and certainly at the um, end of this meal, the Passover meal, they would be singing the Hallel Psalms. This would be Psalms 113 through 118. And so as we read verses 17 through 21, Mark is most likely picking up sometime after the second cup when Jesus lets them know that one of them one of the twelve, will betray him. Now, clearly, in that intimate setting, with such an intense time of remembrance, of reflection, of sobriety, this would be shocking. This would absolutely startle. It's one of these things that if somebody was drinking the cup, you can imagine that cup being spewed out on the table. Or somebody choking down whatever bread that they had. A, a, a lot worse than what you think this tastes like, this, you know? It would be something where they, are you serious? They were incredulous. They were like, one of us. 
One of the twelve. The, the, the word that they used there for sorrow, they were filled with deep sorrow or deep grief. That same word translated sorrowful is used one other time that Mark has. And if you remember just some chapters back when Jesus has a rich man approach him saying, what must I do? I've done all these things. He says, sell your possessions. And then he went away, what? Filled with sorrow. Sorrowful. Dejected. Why? Because he didn't want to follow Jesus. And so that same word now is used one other time here. What us? And in the same way and in the same context it's used of those who would reject Jesus. But now remember in chapters 9 and 10 that we had gone over maybe six weeks ago, Jesus tells the disciples that he'll be delivered over to the hands of men. He said it multiple times, time and time again. I'll, deliver, I'll be delivered over into the hands of the Pharisees and the scribes. I'll be delivered over into the hands of men. He described it many sub, several ways. He's kind of zooming out the picture each time there. He's talking about his deliverance. But each time the disciples seemed numb to that idea. Remember, right afterwards you had, well, okay, that's different. But who's going to sit at your right hand and at your left? Remember? James and John, the Zebedee brothers. Well, what about us? They, didn't even, they thought right past what he was saying, his, his d- being delivered over. Another time they were saying, okay, great, but who's going to be the greatest among you? What position am I going to have in this new kingdom that will be inaugurated by your reigning, Jesus? They looked past that reality of deliverance. It was, it was so far out there that they never took note or took it to heart that it would be so close. But now for the first time, the agent by which this betrayal occurs comes from Within. Like it, it comes from the twelve. So you can imagine, in their minds, first of all, they don't even get the fact that he's going to be betrayed, that the scribes and the Pharisees, that this kingdom isn't coming like they, like they thought. But now, on top of that, Jesus says, hold up a mirror. One of you will betray me. And you can imagine, like, okay, What? What, what in the world? That, that's all of them, totally incredulous, having no idea how to process that information. One of his own. And Jesus alludes to Psalm 140, one, uh, excuse me, 41.9 as the weight and the reality of that betrayal from within his own circle weighs heavy on his heart. It reads, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. James Edwards, in his commentary, he he notes, there may have only been one traitor in the formal sense, but by dawn all the disciples will betray Jesus, if not from greed, then from weakness, fear, or cowardice. And so in verse 22, Jesus takes the unleavened bread, he breaks it, and he takes the cup, which would have been the third cup of Passover, known as the cup of redemption. The cup of redemption. And verse 22 reads, And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. He took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant which poured out for many. Now Jesus' everyday language would have been Aramaic. That's what he would have spoken commonly. And so as we read this verse, which clearly over Reformation error in that time has caused great controversy, not just between Catholics and Protestants, but within Protestantism. Now the words in Aramaic, they don't have the verb is. It wouldn't have read, this is my body. It would have read more like, take this, my body. There's a clear representation there. The word here for body is not sarx, which would mean flesh, actual physical flesh, but soma. Edwards notes that it conveys my person or my whole being. Take me. The breaking of the bread and the drinking of the wine is a symbolic action pointing toward his death on the cross and his blood spilled for many. Furthermore, Christ has the disciples partaking of each element which would emphasize their sharing in his death in some way yet to be fully understood. I can't, I can't imagine that after Acts chapter 2, as God's Spirit illumined the minds and the hearts of the disciples, 
That as they think back on the Last Supper, and they said, oh my goodness, this is what I thought it was, but the Spirit illumines their mind and says, we partook of that with you. We shared in that with you. And we had no idea. As you grow as Christians, you'll see this happen. Young men and young women, as you grow in Christ and you start to understand through other people and God's uh, agents that He's put around you as you grow and are encouraged in Christ, and they start to repeat the same exact things that your parents have been telling you for decades. And all of a sudden it comes to you and it makes you alive and aware. That's what they meant. Now oftentimes they don't associate it with, oh, mom and dad told me that. God forbid they say that. But God does this thing by His Spirit with His Word in the Scriptures that He awakens the heart of people that they would understand who He is more and more as they grow in Christ. And this is what would happen with the disciples. I can't imagine after Acts 2 as they did that. But I do want to take a second to note something important. Mark is thought to be the first Gospel account written that was actually distributed. And each Gospel has an accounting of the Lord's table being instituted. And as the early church began to incorporate the celebration of the Lord's table during their gatherings, Luke's gospel and Paul's letter to the Corinthians were written later as the early church's understanding and application developed. So in Acts, we begin to see the apostles start to walk out the essential elements of what it meant to gather together as the church. Acts 2.42 reads this way, it says, And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. So here we begin to see the starting of what it meant to gather as the church. These elements were there. The breaking of the bread that it mentions was most likely the Lord's Supper and not merely eating food together. You wouldn't devote yourselves to just eating food. Well, maybe some people devote themselves to eating food. I would encourage you not to look at my text thread with Pastor Aaron. But... The reality is he's picturing something of devoting themselves to each other, the word, and the breaking of bread, which would have been the Lord's Supper. In this passage, they devoted themselves clearly, and their, their, their gathering was defined. Teaching through the apostles, fellowship, the Lord's Supper, and prayer. Yes, they also did share meals together in their homes, which in verse 46, just a couple of verses later, points to, and many came to know Christ through the early church's hospitality. That's a true statement. But I would suggest that verse 42 is speaking to them devoted to the celebrating of the Lord's table amidst the other elements of their worship gathering. Moving on, Acts 20, verse 7 gives us another picture. It says this on the first day of the week, when they were gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them intending to depart the next day, and he prolonged his speech until midnight. So on the first day of the week, which would have been Sunday to them, when they gathered to break bread, celebrated the Lord's Supper, Paul preached to them. He opened the Word of God. He spoke to them. 1 Corinthians 11.20, this will be the last one I mentioned as the, the, the church continued to grow and their understanding, we get to see some of it, of how it was practiced. It says this, 1 Corinthians 11.20, When you come together, is it not the Lord's Supper that you eat? The assumption is that they are happening at the same time, coming together as the church and sharing in the Lord's Supper. Scripture gives us the understanding of partaking the Lord's Supper when we are gathered as a church, not when we're scattered. I know it's come into vogue that some people will take their own bread and wine in the comfort of their own homes or via the internet or when friends are having a Bible study. But I would encourage us all to look at how the scripture puts the gathering of the body for worship right alongside the church, visually picturing the gospel through the partaking of the Lord's Supper. When they gathered, they preached the word, you heard the gospel proclaims, and then you pictured it through the Lord's Supper. They did them both, hand in hand. For those of us who are not just auditory learners, and so some of us are better at visual, uh, learning visually, this was just a great, great thing to see and to take part in. The hearing of the word and the picturing of the gospel through the Lord's table. For most of church history, when the church came together, the Lord's table was celebrated each And every week. Now it doesn't prescribe that we can't do it once a month like we do here. 
that historically speaking, and as the, the picture in the early church is painted, you saw them come together and picture the gospel with the Lord's Supper hand in hand. Continuing on with the passage, as with most of what Christ was teaching the disciples, they didn't understand. And in verse 25, Jesus follows with a statement, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. So in this statement, uh, Jesus is pointing to a time and a day in the future. It wouldn't be now. It wouldn't be during his life on earth. But there will be a day when he will drink again of the fruit of the vine when his new kingdom comes. I could turn to Revelation maybe 19 and 21. Both kind of have this wonderful picture. But Isaiah, I think he has this prophetic foretelling prophecy to which Christ is referring in chapter 25, verses 6 through 9, it's on the screens you can see this and you can kind of read with me. Isaiah 25, 6 through 9, it says this, On this mountain the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined, and he will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all people, the veil that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. And the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces and the reproach of his people. He will take away from all the earth for the, for the Lord has spoken. And it will be said on that day, behold, as we sing often, behold, this is our God. We have waited for him that he might save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. This is pointing to the culmination, the, the fulfillment of of what it would be one day to, to dine with Jesus, to be with Him as a people, as His own, Him with us, unhindered by our sin, unshackled by our sins. And He points forward to that day. And so He ends the supper, but He ends without drinking the fourth cup, which would have been known as the cup of praise because He is saving that for when He returns with His new kingdom pictured here in Isaiah. Again, you can read Revelation 19 and 20, 21. They kind of give a, a great picture, and you can see elements of both in this Isaiah passage. But moving on to verses 26 to 31, Jesus keeps the dynamic of the room very, very sober, if not somber, as Mark records it. And coming off what most likely was the last of the Hallel Psalms they would have sung, Psalms 115 through 118. That last one, Psalm 118, I went over that probably about a year ago, a song of salvation being a song of the promised Messiah saving his people because of the Lord's steadfast love, Jesus lets them know that they too would fall away. From them singing of God's salvation, putting their hope in everything, to the reality that Jesus then says, you too, every one of you, will fall away. Quoting from Zechariah 13, Christ once again points to the fact that Scripture speaks of them, another foreordained reality. Without Jesus, they're nothing. When the shepherd is struck, they take flight. Once again, Peter's overconfidence underestimates his weakness, and the reminder of the disciples would follow suit as they all promise their lives for Christ. They promise, no, not me. I'll die with you. What an ironic proclamation that their lives would be saved by their own death, that they would die. Nevertheless, Jesus still would give them hope in verse 28, kind of nestled in there by telling them that he'd see them in Galilee. After this happens and he is raised from the dead, he would see them in Galilee. For Jesus, he doesn't leave them disheartened, but makes sure to note that the picture of betrayal and abandonment they are seeing has more to it. And it has a future hope with Christ. I thank God for his grace that extends beyond our weakness, our sin. So let's take a step back as I promised we would do and look at this passage. Again, you can read that. There are more details. There is so much more to bring out in the Passover meal and Christ's fulfillments. I didn't want to get lost there for a second because I really do want to look at a bigger picture here. Because once again, we see another one of Mark's Sandwiches. You know, we talked about this. He kind of puts passages together and he's got this outer and this inner, uh, and this outside kind of slices of bread. And then the middle is kind of a passage explaining the outer two or accentuating, accentuated by the outer two. 
And so on the one kind of slice of bread, you have verses 17 through 20, picturing the faithlessness of the disciple who betrays Jesus, right? And on that bottom slice here of that bread, you have verses 26 to 31, picturing the faithlessness of the remaining disciples who would abandon Jesus. Yet in the middle here, you have the faithfulness of God's Son as the covenant keeper. The one who was faithful to his own promise. The one who sealed his promise in Genesis 11 with Abraham. And he's fulfilling it now knowing that we could never do it. And it's being pictured here. In front of their eyes. They're participating in it. One slice of bread of abandonment. The other of abandonment. And in the middle, God's faithfulness all the way. Oh, the middle of some sandwiches are so good. And that's Jesus' faithfulness. The covenant keeper. He will not abandon his people. He started and will fulfill his covenant, and it will be done, sealed by his blood. If Mark 14 tells us anything about the Last Supper, and that what we know is the Lord's Supper that we celebrate, it tells us that while we were still sinners, whether we betrayed or we abandoned him, God showed his love for us as Christ died for the ungodly, of which I was one. This is Romans 5.8 pictured very clearly while we were still sinners, while we were at the table, while we were close to him, while we were dipping the bread, while we didn't understand what we were doing, Christ died for you. Christ died for me. That was us. One preacher suggests that this vividly portrays the imagery of Psalm 23, a table being set among enemies. Christ ate at a table he prepared amongst those who would walk away from him. The reality is that the only way that you and I sit at the table is by the grace of God who extends the invitation to share a life-giving meal with him. From start to finish in Mark's accounting, Jesus is clearly the host who arranged for all that took place that evening. He picked the location. He picked the guests. And as the ultimate patriarch would do, he told the Passover story in which he symbolically substituted himself as the central role in the most holy of celebrations for his people, the lamb that was slain for many. Oh, what a God that we serve that would do that, that would look in the eyes of those who would sin against him and yet extend his grace far beyond what we offered him at the table. Far beyond what we offer him each day and each week, and even each time that we pick up the wafer, that we drink the juice, that God's grace meets us there, extending beyond the sin that we bring there and lay at his feet. And he says, no, my last word will do. My body broken and my blood will suffice. It will cover your sin. He makes a place at the table for you. He makes a place at the table for me. And so today the table is set before us once again, and the host, it hasn't changed. The host of the table each time we partake hasn't changed. Jesus is calling and inviting those who are his to eat and drink of him. Today it is still his grace alone, through faith and the work on the cross, his broken body and his blood spilled for us. He took our wrath and our sin and our shame so that the joy that was set before him becomes our joy as we participate in him. And not just that, but he's given us a picture in order for hope to be in our hearts. That one day we will see him face to face and celebrate a meal of meals when he returns. Our inadequacies. Our failings, our wanderings will never overshadow his grace that abounds more than our failures. And so as we come to the Lord's table this morning and we share in this meal together, I want us to think on three things that I think Mark pictures here, that he shows us here. That every time that we think about the Lord's table, that when we take it, that these three things come into our mind, lest we misunderstand its fullness. Now, there's more than this. It goes deeper than this. 
And as the Spirit illumines your mind, you will grab hold of it more and more, and worship will come from your mouth, emanating from your heart, you will understand it deeper. But these two things I, I want you to ponder. First, we have the vertical component where we realize that it's only by grace and faith in Christ's work on the cross that we are at the table. Again, everyone betrayed him. Everyone would leave him. Yet they were invited to the table by God's grace. He said, I will meet you on the other side. There's something I need to do. I need to make you right before my Father so that you can come to him boldly before the throne of grace. And we are there because of God. If we don't understand the gospel reality, then when we grab this in our hands in a few moments, like, don't do that. Put, put it down. Because on the other side, that blood does do something. The blood saves those who by faith come to him, but on the other side, the blood condemns those who don't come to him and believe in, by faith in the work that he's done. And it would not be a good thing to take this flippantly or to take it without understanding or by faith professing who God is. I would ask you, young or old, don't, don't do it. It's a serious warning. The blood of the covenant will do something when we take communion. Number two, we have the horizontal component where we realize that because of the grace that was extended to us, we are now to extend that same grace to others who come to the table the exact same way. The reason you hear about it in Corinthians and later on that they were to do this continually is that they were to understand that by grace they come to God, but by grace they come together. When I say week after week that we gather around the gospel, this is what I mean. That each one of us comes here because of the gospel, and each one of us should care about and love each other because of the gospel. That, ex that grace has been extended to us, and therefore, the person next to us comes the exact same way. We are not better than or less than they are. They are our brother and our sister in Christ. And as Pastor Aaron said earlier, we are being fashioned and formed into the temple of God. If we consider ourselves better or we don't even consider others during this time of partaking communion, the Lord's table, then we're missing something special. You guys are necessary in this body at Shawnee. And so when you're not here, either on Sundays or more particularly when we do it. It's almost like you're missing... I, I don't want to take this picture until everybody in the family's here. When you're not here, we don't take that picture completely. And so God is saying, don't be in the habit of missing fellowship. Why? Because you're missing an opportunity to be in the family picture of God doing His gospel work through His people. It's not just a check off on the list. We don't want to miss you in the picture. We want to think of you during this process. And the last thing is this. We have the future component where we realize that Christ assures us that one day we will be with him for another feast in his kingdom that shall reign forevermore. There is a hope that should continually stir our hearts as we celebrate God's faithfulness in Christ. We don't just dwell in our sin and realize this, we're, we're not enough. We see God's grace cover that. That's what the gospel does. We don't look to the, the left or to the right thinking we're better than, but we say, wow, God, you've placed me next to somebody who's part of this body of Christ, who pictures the gospel, and you've placed in my way intentionally for a reason. And we don't get lost in that where it's looking broken and not all healthy like we want it to. And the gospel says, no, look up. And then finally the gospel says, no, look up. Look to the hope that one day we will come and we will all be together with Jesus. Face to face in glorified bodies without the presence of sin. And we will celebrate at a table and a feast that we can't even dream will look like. And it will be a day that, we sh that should stir our hearts for hope to say, I'm taking this right now knowing that day will come to fruition. It will come about Right now, only partially, then completely and fully. Mark is picturing that. Mark is showing us. And he's painting that picture that Jesus wants the disciples to know that. He wants us to know that one day we will see him face to face. When we look to take the cup, when we look to prepare our hearts, I want us to think on those things. I'm just going to move right into communion. I'm, I, I will pray as a whole, as we read this passage, but you can prepare your cup right now. Getting that first layer. And, and may echo, echo with you, and in case you think this is an insanely serious moment here, 
as much as many of you hate these, <laughs> these things, the styrofoam that you eat that we call the bread, let this resonate in you almost of that last thing. This is a poor picture. This is only in part. The full reality of the feast of Christ is going to be that much better. So let this hopefully as it goes down and as you chew it or it gets stuck to your teeth or whatever that might be. Because it even did that with the matzah. That was unleavened for me. But let us understand that this is poor. This is just a, a dim picture. We will see the real thing later on. Paul says to the church in Corinth in chapter 11, verse 24, I received from the Lord, but I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. I want us to grab this in our hands. You don't have to do this, but this is something I do because I think about the reality of the words. He took bread and he broke it. I break that bread. I snap it in my fingers. I don't want you to drop it, so if you're going to drop it, that's going to be weird. So, but I break the bread just to understand that Christ's body was broken. He died for me. I dwell upon that reality of what the cross would be, and that secured a way for me to come to him. It was necessary, but it was the joy that was set before him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your body broken. We thank you for the fact that you made a way for us. We thank you for the sacrifice that you made for us. And so as we partake of this bread, Lord, may we think about that impact on our lives. May we think about those who are next to us. May we think about the time to come where things will be whole once again. In Jesus' name. When he given thanks, he broke it and he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. You prepare the cup. In the same way, also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Father, we thank you for your blood spilled. We thank you that it was for many. We thank you that you call to many by your grace and through your blood to come to the table and that we're able to even sit there. We thank you for your love for us as a body. And Lord, help us show that love and grace to others around us. We thank you for the future when you've secured a place by your blood that we will sit before you one day at the Feast of Feasts. In Jesus' name. This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me.